In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, how well do you do with authority? I don't know that any of us really do well with it, right? I mean, I've never met somebody who said, I just love having people in charge of me all the time. But I'm sure some of you probably handle it better than others, or, or maybe we should more accurately say some of us probably handle it worse than others. And why is that? Why do we struggle, generally speaking, with authority? I think there are probably a number of reasons. One big one, I think, is that we don't want anyone else making decisions about our lives, right? No one knows you better than you, and so no one knows what direction you should go, where you should be, what you should be doing with your life than you. And it doesn't matter how many poor decisions you've made in your own life, how many times you've screwed it up, how many people you've hurt, you still know what's best for you, and we're convinced of that. Another, I think, is because we equate authority with status, don't we? A boss or a manager is of a higher status than their employees. A, a teacher has a higher status than her students, and we all want a higher status in life. And so we, we try to close that gap between ourselves and those who have authority over us, either by cutting those in authority down in the hopes of bringing them closer to us, or by challenging their authority in the hopes of lifting ourselves up. None of us does well with authority. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts begins every episode with this disclaimer for the hearer. And it says, you really, as a responsible listener, should be skeptical of everything we are about to say. Because that's generally what you should probably do and how you should approach almost everything in life. Got to be skeptical of it. And I think that's true when it comes to how we view authority. We're skeptical of it, and those who are in position of authority. Which makes it all the more interesting when you hear how people respond to listening to Jesus preach for the first time, is it not? This is what they said. They were amazed at Jesus' teaching. Why? Because He taught them as one who had authority. Now, now, maybe that was just because they weren't used to having or seeing authority in their lives. Those people in that small village of Capernaum. No. No, they, they had plenty of people who were in authoritative positions over them. They had the secular authorities of the Roman government who used their authority to tax the Jews to limit their freedom, to occupy their land, to rule them with all sorts of laws and threaten them with punishment if they broke them. These people in Capernaum also had religious authorities. They had the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes and rabbis, all of which were sort of condensed when they were referred here to being the, the teachers of the law which already tells you what the main thrust and emphasis of their teaching was. They viewed themselves as being experts in God's law. They knew what God commanded His people to do, and how to do it, and when to do it. But they knew even more than that. You see, the teachers of the law were such experts in the law that they even had created their own set of laws which were supposedly designed to help God's people keep God's laws even better. For example, God said, I want you to rest on the Sabbath day. I created everything, and then I rested on the seventh day. I want you to do the same. So the teachers of the law then had to figure out 
well, how many steps are you actually allowed to take on the Sabbath before we can consider it doing work? In the Old Testament, God regularly instructed His people to wash their clothes before they entered His presence to symbolize their need to have their sins and their lives cleansed before God. But the teachers of the law said that you actually needed to ceremonially wash anything and everything every time you went out into public just in the small case that you happened to brush up against someone or something that was unclean. God gave Israel ten commandments. But by the time Jesus arrives, the teachers of the law had discovered 613 more. Can you imagine what it must have been like sitting in the pews in the synagogue every Sabbath, listening to the rabbi just read through all of the laws or inform them of the new laws that they had just come up with? To the point that Jesus once described these experts in the law this way. He said of them, you tie up heavy loads and put them on people's shoulders, but you are not willing to lift a finger to move them yourselves. Now the Jews had plenty of authority in their lives. They weren't looking for new authority. In fact, every aspect of their lives was controlled by the authority of someone else. And what inevitably happens when your whole life is overrun with rules and laws? Well, there's really only one of two options. Either you look at those laws and you use them to evaluate your life and you are filled up and swell with pride because you look at how well you have kept all those laws at least better than most of the other people around you. Or... You look at those laws and you use them to evaluate your life and you see that you are nothing but a complete and utter failure. That you have not kept those laws well enough and so, well, your life is nothing but moment after moment of trial and despair. The teachers of the law were the former. When it came to morality, they saw themselves as being vastly superior to everyone else that they saw around them. The average Jew, on the other hand, the people who would sit in those pews at the synagogue every Sabbath, well, they saw themselves as being the latter. Weighed down by an increasingly heavy demand of laws laid on their shoulders each and every week. By whom? By the authority. Because that's what authority does, right? We know this. Authority takes. That's why we're so skeptical of it, regardless of what generation you're from. Anti-war, anti-government, anti-establishment, anti-working for the man. Because all they do is take, take, take. It gives demands so that it can take. That's what authority does. And the people in Capernaum that day, they knew that too. So it wasn't just that Jesus taught with authority. They knew plenty of people who had authority. So what was it that made Jesus' teaching different? Well, the crowd clarifies that later on in our text. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. Jesus brought a new teaching to these people. Something different from what they had heard regularly on a weekly basis. So what was it? Well, the main action of this account, of this story, tells us. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now consider for a moment how the teachers of the law had handled this demon-possessed man. First, they either would have had to just plain out ignore him, 
because there was nothing they could do to cleanse him of this evil spirit, showing that they lacked any real kind of authority over the demon. Or perhaps, and this is sort of the impression they get that we get, they weren't even aware that this man was possessed. Because he doesn't seem to cause a scene until Jesus arrives. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Why, sitting in the synagogue, in the house of God, would agents of the devil be silent? You'd think that they would want to be distracting, cause disturbances, promote false teaching, essentially do whatever they could to take attention from the truth of God's Word. But what if the reason that that demon was silent is because that is exactly what was already happening? as the consciences of God's people were being weighed down more and more by impossible demands, most of which weren't even from God, and the sinful pride of the teachers of the law was puffing them up more and more. I mean, what else could the devil ask for? So what could the teachers of the law then have used their authority to do for this demon-possessed man? Well, they really only had two options. And we see them use both of them later on in the ministry of Jesus. In John chapter 9, we're told that Jesus encountered a man who was born blind. And this was that unique story where Jesus spits in the mud or in the dirt and he makes some mud and he puts it on the man's eyes and he tells him to go wash it off and suddenly the man can see. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law will not accept this man's simple explanation as to how he was given the ability to see. They called him a liar and an extreme sinner. They called his parents in to see if he really was born blind. And, and when they said, yes, he was, we don't know how it happened, but he was blind and now he can see. And they attacked his parents too. You see, armed with only the law, all the teachers of the law could do is essentially use their authority to accuse the man, to point back at the man and say, see, you are the reason that this is happening to you. In the very next chapter, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus again is in Capernaum, and he starts teaching in a house. And so many people want to come and hear Jesus that we're told there was not even standing room only, but that everyone was squeezed in shoulder to shoulder. And, and, and this man who was lame and unable to walk, his friends lifted up his mat and started carrying him and they couldn't get him in the house to see Jesus. So we're told they cut a hole in the roof and lowered him down right in front of Jesus. And Jesus looks at this man and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And immediately we're told that the teachers of the law accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Why does this fellow talk like that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? To which Jesus replied, I love this, which is easier to say to a person who's paralyzed? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he does. Uh, armed with only the law, the teachers of the law could also have accused Jesus of somehow acting out of line. You see, the only thing the teachers of the law could have done in this situation was either to accuse the man of doing something to deserve the evil spirit or accuse Jesus of doing something wrong. This is what the authority looked like to the people in Capernaum. This was the only kind of authority they knew. The authority to take. The authority to accuse. The authority to imprison. But all of that changes when Jesus walked into that synagogue that day. 
And how does Jesus use his authority? How does Jesus address the man possessed by an evil spirit? He doesn't hear the outburst from the man and say, are you serious? Like, are you really that weak that you allowed yourself to be overtaken by an evil spirit? What were you dabbling in that you invited this into your life? No, Jesus doesn't ask the man about his synagogue attendance, trying to determine whether or not he was worthy of Jesus' help. He doesn't even ask him to commit to making some significant changes in his life, ensuring that this kind of unfortunate possession wouldn't happen again in the future. No, Jesus simply sees a man hurting. A man whose body was literally being beaten from the inside out. A man whose mind and soul had been taken hostage by hell. And with a simple command, Jesus sets him free. Be quiet. Come out of him. At that, the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority, he even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. And news spread about Jesus quickly over the whole region of Galilee. How does Jesus use his authority? Well, he uses it to take as well, to take away sin and guilt and the fear of death to take the devil's power. But he also used all authority in heaven and on earth that is his as true God to give to you. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. To give you a life that has been set free from sin and death and to live as a child of God Jesus said, I have not come to demand your service, but to serve you and to give my life as a ransom for all, to grant peace and rest for your weary souls. I didn't come to find the self-righteous. I came to find the unrighteous, to seek and save the lost to welcome you into my eternal home, to adopt you into my eternal family. That's how Jesus uses his authority. Can you see how that would have been so drastically different to these people? How much more beautiful the authority of Jesus was than any other authority they had ever seen or experienced? Why the news spread about him so quickly? A new authority was there. The people knew it. The demons knew it. Brothers and sisters, do you know it? I think one of the biggest reasons I hear from people when they want to tell me why they they stay away from church or, or have little to no interest in Christianity is because they view the whole thing as putting yourself under this new law code. And they have plenty of authority in their lives already. Authority which they despise. Why would you want even more authority in your life, like a church, or the Bible, or God? And I can't help but wonder where they get that impression from. That that's what it means to be a Christian. That that's what a life looks like when it's lived under God. Could it be that this is what they see from you and me? Is it the way that we talk about church? That the only time we seem to reference the Bible is when we're quoting it to condemn someone. That God is such a small part of your life, it becomes easy for someone to conclude He's almost like a necessary evil in your life, just like every other authority you have. You know, no different than politicians and bosses. Did you catch what was being compared in our second scripture reading in Hebrews chapter 3? 
I referenced it. It was a comparison between Moses and Jesus. Moses as this embodiment of and picture of the law, and Jesus as the picture and fulfillment of the Gospel. And St. John compared the, the two of them, Moses and Jesus, this way. He said, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, that's why the writer to the Hebrews says that Jesus is worthy of more honor than Moses. Because the authority of Jesus is greater than the authority of Moses. Because the gospel is greater than the law. The question then becomes, which authority do you live your life under? Do you live under the tyranny of your guilt? Never quite believing that you're forgiven, which means you can't seem to forgive anyone else either? Do you live under the authority of death? held captive by its fear? Do you talk about death the same way as someone who doesn't know Jesus and doesn't believe in His resurrection? Do you love your neighbor and look for ways to live for and serve them because you know that this is how Jesus, your Savior, views and treats you? Or is life really nothing more than just an opportunity to love and serve yourself? Because you know what? This is the way that everyone else does it in the world. If you don't take care of number one, no one else will. And if you think it's not fair that the world would look at you and based on you make their assumptions or judgments about the church or the Bible or God, then what do you think the writer to the Hebrews was saying when he said Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are God's house. You are God's handiwork. You are the display of His power and grace and truth and authority. You are the craftsmanship of the divine. Walking, talking, dwelling places of God made by Him and for Him to showcase His love and glory to the world. I mean, we're not told, but can you imagine how it must have changed that man in that synagogue that day? And you think, well, that was different. I mean, that guy was possessed by an evil spirit. Pretty easy to, to make a change like that. And what are we? I mean, what, do you, what is it that you think you witnessed earlier this morning when Louis was baptized? What do you think it was that God was doing when you were baptized? It's an exorcism. It's a cleansing of sin. It's a driving out of the devil. It's a divorce between you and the world. You are no longer its slave. And He no longer has a presence and a power and authority in your life. All of that is done away with to make room for the new authority. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is now written all over your life. The Holy Spirit now resides and takes up residency in your heart Friends, you live under a more beautiful authority. It's the most beautiful authority. The authority of Jesus Christ and His forgiveness. The authority that gives life and hope and healing where there was once only pain, death, and despair. Jesus used all His beautiful authority to give to you everything He is and everything He has to make you His very own and to make sure that you would know that He is yours and you are His. 
And he does all that so that through you, he might give it to even many more others. Yes, even to those you and I don't think deserve it. That is why the news of him spread so rapidly throughout the region. How awesome would it be if it would do the same here? God grant it. In Jesus' name, amen.